thank you for being here on a first Wednesday. Such a wonderful spirit in the house tonight. I'm thankful for this opportunity to be with you all tonight. It's a little bit different format. Um, tonight we are going to conduct things a little bit differently. And tonight, uh, my wife and I, Kaylee, we are going to be speaking to everyone. And uh, if, you, if we haven't had an opportunity to meet yet, my name is Daniel Bernard, and this is my wife, Kaylee. And we serve as the student pastors here um, at Royalwood Church of Anthem Student Ministries. And Kaylee serves as our circles director, which is our small groups ministry here at the church. And so uh, tonight we are going to be um, addressing parents. How many of you are parents in the room? You have children. Anybody got children? Let me see where you're at. God bless you. I'm going to get you out early so you can get in bed early tonight. Everybody said amen. But we're going to be addressing students and parents tonight. But also, I believe if you're in the room tonight and you don't have children or that's a, a phase in your life that, you know, children are grown and gone, we're going to be speaking about some principles that I believe will still be beneficial to you. And uh, this conversation, if you will, has really uh, arisen out of feedback from parents and questions and different things. So we decided to take um, tonight and address, uh, address that. I've been... Um, doing uh, full-time student ministry for 10 years now. It's kind of crazy to say that. And Kaylee and I have been working together for seven of those 10 years. So between us, you know, we're, we don't speak from a place tonight of authority in the sense that we have teenagers, but rather um, our experience comes from 10 years of conversations, dealing with students, feedback with parents. So hopefully we can share some things, um, some principles and some things that may be beneficial um, to you parents and to you uh, students. So Kaylee, why don't you give us a little more insight into kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight. So um, this all started at a staff meeting a couple of weeks ago. We were talking to Pastor Macy, which we miss them so much. We were talking to them about um, some of the things that we've experienced in Anthem and just kind of updating him on some things and some things that we had read about. And he said, I really feel like you should share this with the church. And so that's why we're up here tonight is sharing some of those things with you. And really, it's an awesome launch to our circle semester that's going to be taking place for the months of June and July. If you've already signed up for a circle, let me see your hand. Hey, look at it. Love it. If you have not signed up for a circle, please do so tonight. You've got the cards on your chair ready for you to sign up and you can leave those on your chair or give them to the ushers on the way out. Anthem students, you're still with us every Wednesday, so don't worry. You don't have to sign up for a circle because you're already in one. So, but that's kind of where all of this started was just talking about um, some things that we've seen and pastor just thought that we should share those with you guys tonight. And let me give you a heads up. Daniel and I, you know, we work in student ministry and so we need a lot of feedback. Okay, so if we're looking out there tonight, past, you know, some people might let y'all slide with this face. But Daniel and I need affirmation, okay? So if we say something, I want y'all to say amen. Can y'all just say that? Amen. Yes, or Thank do one of those, mmm, right. mmm, yeah. Or what, even, if, even if you forgot what we were saying and totally zoned out because it's Wednesday and you're tired, at the end of a sentence, just say, mmm. That'll, that'll all help us out, okay? There you go. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one of the, just to jump right in, one of the first realizations that you have most likely already come to as a parent, as a student, or as someone, even if you don't have children or kids, that you realize on the job, just as you interact with people, is that we live in a ever, an ever-changing world. Just the world is changing and moving so rapidly. And as a parent, as a student pastor, it can be almost impossible to keep up with much less stay ahead of the things that our students are facing, that people are facing. How many of you feel like you have a really good grasp on like all the new social media apps and things going out? It's like four people. Yeah, so anybody, y'all know about Kick? Parents know about Kick? What about uh, Weeble? Anybody know about Weeble? Yeah, well, I just made that one up. No, I'm just kidding, that is a real, that is a real, no. But, um, so, really? but, but the reality is that things are changing so rapidly, and I, I know that in my, from my perspective, it feels daunting to try to feel a, a way to stay relevant or stay up to date to even help people accomplish things, and as a parent, um, you know, we're not to that point with, with our daughter yet, but I realize that it can be difficult, and the fact of the matter is it's a very simple answer, but very difficult to carry out, and the answer is to live a principled life, live a principled life, because principles are timeless 
and can be applied to any situation, you know. But living a principled life takes a lot of work, takes a lot of dedication, and a lot of faithfulness. So we just did a series on Sunday with our students and talked about principled and asked this question. Uh, what scripture talks about Netflix? Where in the Bible does it say, thou shalt not watch this show or watch this show? And of course, you know, everyone was flipping through their Bible or on their phone like, what? Uh, but it doesn't, right? The Bible doesn't say anything about Netflix. But what does the Bible say? It does give us a principle, right? We're familiar with Psalms 101.3. It says, uh, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I will hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. So what we realize is that although there may not be a, a direct thing that speaks to Netflix or the thing that we're facing right now, there is a guiding principle that we can use to inform those decisions. So again, to carry this example out, it can be, as a parent, it'd be impossible to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to list out all the shows that you are not allowed to watch. I'm going to list out all the shows that you can watch, right? You can't keep up. There's no way. But instead, if we take a step back and give the principle that guides that decision, then we empower the student, we empower someone else to make that informed decision, and we can keep them accountable to a principle much easier than a set of rules or something like that. We see in Romans 12:2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. This is a New Living Translation. Changing the way you think, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So what I love about this is, you know, students and parents and really anybody, but we can't just focus on following the rules for the rules' sake. We can't just focus on doing the right things, but rather it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of our intentions. If we allow God to transform the way we think, then he will guide us with what to do and what we shouldn't do. If our life is built on principles, not what other people say or do, not necessarily affected by what other people do or don't do, even if those people be in church, meddling a little bit, but if we don't build our lives on the comparison of other people, of the families, my life, my family, my home is gonna be built on biblical principles and those principles will stand the test of time. No matter what situation we find, ourselves in. To give you a little personal example, I grew up in a pastor's home, and uh, growing up, you know, some people had different expectations of me. As the pastor's son, they felt like I was supposed to do this, not supposed to do that. And the conversation my dad had with me about such an occasion, he sat me down, he said, Daniel, we do what we do. We live the way we live. It has nothing to do with the fact that we're pastors. It has nothing to do with the fact that I'm the pastor. We live this way because we're Christians. If I'm a pastor, no matter what I do, this is who we are. Our, the way we live our life is not predicated on the position that I hold. So then he got elected to serve over the South Texas area of different churches. Same conversation. I've been elected as district superintendent, but that doesn't change anything because we are who we are because we are Christians. And he, he moved into different positions, but that conversation was such a guiding principle in my life that, you know what? Be who you are. doesn't matter where you are, what position you find yourself in, what situation you find yourself in. Build your life on sustainable principles, and they will carry you um, through your entire life. And Kaylee has some insight, um, has, was uh, fortunate and wonderful, grew up in a, a family that had some principles, and so I want her to share a little bit about uh, her life from that perspective as well. Yeah, so um, I grew up in a minister's home as well, and so we had some of the same conversations because you do kind of feel like you're in a box, but let's face it, everybody kind of feels like they're in a glass box where everybody's looking at them. That's the nature of social media, right? You just want everybody to look at you all the time. But my parents, one thing that really stood out to me was that they raised me unapologetically Christian. And uh, sometimes in student ministry, we see uh, parents that feel pressure to apologize to their children for calling them to live a Christ honoring life like baby I'm sorry you can't go there we're Christian baby I'm sorry you you can't do that because we're Christian you know it's more from a stance of being apologetic instead of saying hey we get to do this this is our honor this is our privilege we get to do this because we know Jesus and we know what his word says and that was something that was just so empowering to me because not by my own strength, not by my own might, but by the grace of God, I can say that I never drank in school. I didn't sleep with somebody before I got married. I didn't act one way at school than I did at home. I didn't live a double life and I didn't feel that societal pressure that was constantly pulling on teenagers because I think my parents instilled into me that, hey, this isn't a punishment, this is a privilege. 
Like we get to live this way because this is a privilege. And so um, I moved to Louisiana just for my senior year of high school. So I had gone to one school my whole life in Missouri. And then my parents had to go pastor somewhere. Lame, just kidding. But they picked me up and moved me to Louisiana just for my senior year of high school. So you can imagine 17-year-old Kaylee is just, <sighs> just heartbroken. You left all my friends. I don't talk to any of those people today, but it was really heartbreaking at the time. So they packed me up and moved me to Louisiana, and I just thought for sure that I wasn't going to fit in, that nobody was going to understand the one little girl walking around in skirts, and it was going to be miserable. But I really feel like God wanted to get his glory through this, so a lot of incredible things happened. I won student of the year my senior year. I was lead in my uh, school play. I was given the Patriotism Award, which is huge for an army town. I was given all your highest character awards. I got the most scholarships of anybody in my class, and I was elected prom queen all my senior year of high school. And again, I'm not saying that for me, but what I'm saying is, is that you can be who God has called you to be without compromising who you are. There's not anything incredibly special, now I'm not fishing here, but there's not anything incredibly special about me. Objection. Yeah, about me, but I feel like people are drawn to students that are sure about who they are and confident in who God has called them to be. You don't have to compromise your consecrations in order to be appealing to this world. You can be who God has called you to be and still make a difference. And now sidebar, I did go to prom, but I, my parents took me to prom. Just let that sink in. Just all my teenagers, just let that sink in. That my pastor, dad, and my Southern Belle mom took me to prom, okay? And so I was elected prom queen, and my dad's in the back like, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And, you know, all praising the Lord and stuff. And then, so you're the prom king, okay? I'm the prom queen. My dad comes up, and he escorts me off the stage, and the prom king is like, what's going on? Well, I don't dance. And the school knew that I didn't dance, so they actually called and asked my parents' permission for me to be elected prom queen. So they escort me on the platform, and then much to the, what's the word here? Dismay of the prom king, his mom comes up on the platform, and he dances with his mom at prom. So I don't think he ever forgave me for that, but just had to clear that up. I'm not saying you can just go to dances and all that kind of stuff without your parents' permission. But I'm just saying all that to say that you don't have to apologize for being who you are. And students, this life that you have found in Jesus is not a punishment, it is a privilege. These consecrations are an honor and not a burden. And if I, you know, I can meddle a little bit in anthem, so I'm just gonna pretend like I'm an anthem tonight. But if I could just stop right here and say, that um, when we get questions that deal with modesty or living or dressing a certain way, I just wanna reinforce tonight that modesty is not just about how you dress, it's a way of life. And so you can be dressing every way that you're supposed to dress, but if you're posting seductive selfies on social media, that is not modest. If you're saying things that you should not say, that is not modest. If you're having conversations that you should not have, that's not modest. So just remember, students and parents, that modesty is not just about following the rules. Because if that's what it becomes, it will fall. And it will not become a part of your life at one point. But if you make it a way of life, you uncover all of these great promises that God has for you. So I would just say that to say that remember... When you are living for Jesus only 50% of the time around certain crowds and around certain people, when you live for Jesus only 50% of the time, that takes 100% of your heart. So just remember that in your life, that when you live for Jesus 100% of the time, you get 100% of the benefits. But if you live for him only 50% of the time, 
It's taking 100% of your heart, so remember those things. Don't feel like you have to apologize for calling your family to live a Christ-centered life. Remember that it's an honor and a privilege and unfolds so many amazing things that God has in store for you. Chill, babe. Sorry. <laughs> that's all. That's great. Um, no, and I think, you know, to, to take this and really um, take it out of the context of parenting and students, I think for everyone in this room, one of the, the key things about this is you need to solidify why you're doing things. Because, uh, you know, I, I would, I kind of phrase like this, the generation that came before me was the uh, I told you so generation, right? And to, to, from this, my parents' generation to me, why am I doing this? Because I told you so. So my, growing up, it was, we were kind of the why, 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 why to do this? Well, we're past that point now. Students aren't asking why, they're just going out and finding the answer for themselves. And whatever that answer is, they just find that. So I think, at, you know, on parents, um, this changes the conversation. So for instance, if I'm asking, you know, I go to school, someone asks me, why do you do this? Why do you live this way? If my answer is because my parents make me, because we're Christians, because we go to church, that builds a wall, right? Okay, that's for you, that's not for me. Versus if, if, a, if a child, if a student, if someone, if you have been so instilled with why, that the answer is more like, you know what, I, I do this because it's a way that I honor God. It's a way that I show my relationship with God. I'd love to talk to you about it more. All of a sudden, instead of a wall, I built a bridge to that person. So instilling a why into students empowers them to answer tough questions, to invoke conversation with other people. So I want to just encourage you parents, don't be afraid of students' questions because them questioning means they're interested. Asking questions means they want to know. Asking questions means they're seeking knowledge and they're seeking it from you, which I feel like is an incredible thing. Whenever someone comes and asks me a question, I pretty much stop and say thank you first of all, because I say thank you for giving me a voice in your life. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak into your life. I take that as an honor and as a privilege. So I just wanna remind you, always just instill the why we do things in your students and you will reap the benefits in their life for, for years to come. Yes, and just kind of jumping back for a second, we do in Anthem, and Daniel and I have gotten questions before, like, well, so-and-so's doing that, and they get to do that, and, you know, all this kind of thing. We, we get in this bad habit of looking at everybody else around us, but I just want to reinforce tonight that just because somebody else lives a certain way does not give me permission to live that way. If I'm living a principled life, I don't need permission from anybody else except the principles that I find in the Word of God. So don't look around thinking like, well, mom, they get to go there, why don't you let me go there? It does not even matter if somebody else in Anthem gets to do something that you don't get to do. The point is, is that your family is living a principled life, so just because somebody else is living a certain way does not auto automatically give you permission to live that way. And when it comes to everything in life, I've said this before in Anthem, but remember, don't lower your standards just because somebody else hasn't raised theirs. So whether you are looking for a dating relationship, because you know, everybody, we all fall in love at 13 years old. Whether you're looking at a dating relationship or whatever you're looking for in life, remember, don't settle, don't lower your standards just because somebody else hasn't raised theirs. Don't set your bar at somebody else's minimums. Set your bar based off of your examples and your leaders and that'll get you where you need to go. That's really good, babe, that's good. So in looking at that, and this is a question we get a lot from parents, how do I motivate my students? How do I, how do I encourage them, how do I push them to be better? What do I do to, to get them to be their best? And I think this is a question that if you're an employer tonight, if you have people that work um, under you as employees, you ask this question, how can I motivate people? How can I help push people forward? And uh, I think the answer is a, uh, two things that, that meet in the middle, and it's high expectations coupled with, not apart from, high belief. So I think it's important to have high expectations, but for those expectations to be ma matched with belief in the person, they can do it. Um, I read this uh, the other day. Researchers did a study of Ivy League college students, thousands of college students, on how they responded to feedback on their homework using sticky notes. So whether the homework needed improvement, whether it was encouraging, they would write sticky notes, and, and they tracked these students, and they used a similar style of feedback for different students, and they categorized and watched their performance based on the feedback. 
And there was one phrase and one idea that over time produced such a measurable difference that the researchers called it magic. It produced up to 40% more effort and better grades on behalf of thousands of students. And the phrase they worked in in many different ways was simply this, I'm giving you this feedback because I have high expectations of you and I know that you can meet them. I'm giving you this feedback, whether it was constructive criticism, whether it was admonishment, but the reason, giving the why, I'm giving you this feedback because I have high expectations and I know that you can meet them. And I found that so interesting in our lives as a student pastor too, when I talk to students, I find those two things, high expectations, but coupled with belief that I, the only reason I have these expectations is I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can do it. So parents, don't set low expectations for your students. I think a lot of times, um, I, not that I have done this before, but I've seen before that it's like, we almost wanna set expectations low in our life. That way, if those expectations are exceeded, it, we're like, oh yay, we're pleasantly su surprised. But I can tell you, set high expectations for your students because Daniel and I see every week that the students in Anthem are intelligent, they are well-liked, they are smart, they are kind, they are talented, they are all of those things. So don't be afraid to set high expectations for your students because we know that you believe in them and we believe in them. And we know that God has a special calling for every single student in Anthem and I will not accept that anybody in Anthem is supposed to meet mediocre expectations. We have high expectations for each student in Anthem and in Anthem, so don't be afraid to set those high expectations. And students, if you're a student, point at yourself and say, that's me. Okay, that's me. Your parents are a lot smarter than you think they are. And parents, your kids are a lot smarter than you think they are sometimes. And they are looking at you all the time. Parents, your kids are looking at you all the time. They're watching you 24-7. Like you're, at, you're caught in Disney World as one of those characters and one of those weird things. And your students are the cemented spectators that are just constantly looking at you. Parents, that's your life. I'm sorry. That's the way it is. But that's who you are. Your students are watching you 24-7. I read a book that said... When students are younger, it's mommy, daddy, watch me, watch me. As they get older, it's mom and dad, I'm watching you. Because we all know teenagers can be a little creepy. I was one, I might still be a little weird. The jury's still out. But they're watching you. If you don't think you're having an impact on your student, you are wrong. They are learning from you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are learning how you respond when you are angry. They're learning from you how they should respond when somebody makes them angry. They're learning how to react when something happens that they don't like. They're learning how to react when they're sad. They're learning how to react when they're happy. They're learning what to do when things go right and learning what to do when things go wrong. They're learning what they should post on social media and what they should not post. They're learning how to be, uh, handle things in a Christ-like manner. From you they are learning from you 24 hours a day seven days a week so remember those things that's something that Daniel and I have found to be so true in Anthem is that when we see parents that are willing to set those good examples for their students it helps them so much far down far down the road down the road far away down the highway. It's all good. That one. Um, it helps them so much in life. Okay, I mess up things all the time. I say Reese's, and we have a battle about it every time somebody gets a Reese's in Anthem. Just sidebar. But on the flip side of that, students, your parents are a lot smarter than you think. Can I get an amen from the parents in the room? Amen. Students, your parents are a lot smarter than you think. Way smarter. Okay, I can tell you, now that I've grown and I see what my parents were trying to tell me, they're way smarter than you think they are when they're younger. And I have a little bit of a news flash. Are you ready, students? Is everybody, everybody ready? Cameron's saying no, he's not ready. I, okay, I'm gonna tell you right now. Students, we know that you have two Instagram accounts. We know you do, and you say it's spam, but really, is it spam? Or is there like 
you know, I'm not, uh, Amber probably doesn't have one, so I'm going to point on Amber. But Amber, is it like her real one is Amber and her fake one is Shamber? Okay, I don't know. We know, okay? We know you have two Instagram accounts. We know you have a secret boyfriend or girlfriend. We know that that secret boyfriend or girlfriend is probably not good for you. We know when you like things on social media that you should not. We know when you do things you should not do. We know. All the parents say, we know. You're not as sneaky as you think you are, okay? We know, okay? My mom and dad tell me all kinds of stuff that they knew I did when I was younger that I thought I was being so sneaky, and I wasn't. So, that being said, if your parents already know, which I'm 99%, 99.99% sure they do, lean on your parents. They know what they're talking about. They've lived life, they've gotten to where they are today because they are smart, capable, God-honoring people. So, if your mom comes to you and says, I don't know, Hayden, I just don't think that you should be dating that guy. I would listen to her. If Ian, if somebody, if your mom comes to you and says, I don't think you should have that job. It's because she probably knows. Listen to your parents. And all the parents again said, amen. Hallelujah, okay? Students, your parents are smarter than you think. That's awesome. So, um, Thanks, babe. how do we, in looking at this, how do we bridge this gap? So we, we see that there's a gap that exists between students and parents, and really this applies to anyone uh, you work with people, you know, from a different generation in your place of work. How do you, you know, bridge this gap? What can you do to help with this? And, you know, every parent uh, probably has experienced this driving home from school. How was school today? Uh, how was school today? Great. Awesome. So wh wh what, what principles can we take? What are some takeaways that we can do and, and maybe analyze? Some, I want to give you some things to think about in your communication with uh, your students because the, the biggest thing is communication. How are we communicating? And so there's three simple areas of communication that I want you to analyze in your life and think about in three ways, three things that your communication needs to be open, honest, and clear. We need open communication, honest communication, and clear communication. In a very simple way, students, you know, you want to know that your parents want to hear from you. You want that feeling that my parents are open to what I have to say. Parents, you know, you need to start with that, lead in that communication, be open with your students, and I think sometimes it's maybe hard for parents, um, you know, to be open about things and, and understand that. Being being honest with your kids, you know, being honest with your kids, you know, doesn't mean that you you can't shelter them from some things. As a parent, you have that prerogative, but being honest means you can give them real answers without divulging everything. You can meet them at the point of, of their satisfaction, which looks different to a four year old than a fourteen year old. You know, again, my life is an example. It's a very difficult concept, I'm sure, for my parents as pastors when the majority of the conversations they were having were very sensitive topics. You know, we get home and they're discussing a family that's going through a tumultuous situation. So me as a, as a young child, you know, I wanna be included in that. I don't wanna feel like mom and dad are, are one family unit and the kids are completely separate. So what I realized in hindsight that my parents would speak to us, they would be honest, open with us, but they would understand the place we were in life and communicate to that level. So when I was eight, it may be a conversation like, Daniel, we want you to help us pray for the Smith family. Uh, they're going for, through a really difficult time, and we want to bind together in prayer for them. When I was 17, 18, maybe it was, hey, Daniel, I want to let you know, uh, you know, Mrs. Smith has decided to leave Mr. Smith. They're going through a divorce. Pray for their, their children. You know, they're having a really tough time. But what that did is that made me feel included on the decisions and the conversations my parents were having. So because I had the information, I didn't feel like I was always on the outside. That may seem simple. What, what I realize now is that I felt like when we prayed together, I had power in the things that my family was talking about. It wasn't a us and us and them, it was us together, that we are one family. And of course, obviously there are things that they talked about that they didn't tell us about, but what I realized is that my parents being open to me about things in the church, being open and honest to a point that you know, they understood I could, I could meet them at, made a huge difference in the way that I felt about my relationship with them. So open and honest communication, and then finally, clear communication. Perception is reality. The way communication is received 
uh, matters more than what you're saying is the way that it's received. And you could probably break this down further, but just uh, for food for thought, I want to just kind of break it down into sender, message, and recipient. These three aspects. And a great way, I think, to think about this is if I'm sitting in my office and I say the phrase, the door's open, that could mean so many different things. That could mean, hey, please shut my door because my door's open. That could mean, please come in. I invite you to come and talk. The door's open. Come on in. Have a seat. Let's talk. It could mean you're fired. You're sitting here. The door's open. Please leave. Right? This simple phrase can mean so many different things all based on the context. So I think sometimes, if we're honest with ourselves, we only hear what we say from our perspective. We think less about the recipient and more about the sender. So guess what? Parents, your students hear things differently than you say them. Now, I'm not saying that as an excuse that they can, you know, get away with things, but what I'm saying is be cognizant of the recipient. Hey, guess what? If you want a lot of accountability from your student, it's probably going to happen easier over text message while they're out because teenagers respond to immediate digital communication, right? That's the generation we're in. Immediate digital communication is much easier to receive than I want you to call me every 10 minutes. Probably not going to happen. If you call me in the day, I'm probably going to let it go to voicemail. And if you leave me a voicemail, I'm probably going to look at the transcription on my iPhone, never actually listen to the voicemail, and I'll text you or call you back. Why? That just, that's just the way I'm wired, I guess. Now, call me and I'll answer, but don't everyone test that tomorrow, please. But no, we have to understand what am I as the sender, the way I interpret what I'm saying, how am I sending it, and who's my recipient. These things are really important um, to understand, especially in parental and student um, communications. And uh, you know, I want to bring this to a close, but I want to give you, and again, I want to kind of take this to a 10,000 foot view outside of a parental and student uh, relationship. And I want to give you a couple of um, things to take home. And from uh, Dr. Tim Elmore, I'm loving reading his, uh, his insight. He's the founder and president of a network um, called Growing Leaders, best-selling author and international speaker. And he has what he calls habitudes, which are images from leadership habits and attitudes. So habitudes are just these simple phrases that this remind us of a key principle, and I want to give you three uh, quick ones, and I think this will help with parents and students navigating situations. The first one, first one I want to leave you with is student, uh, parents, play chess, not checkers. Play chess, not checkers. So what does that mean? If you were to pull out a chess board and a checkers board, you'd realize that the game board is identical. It looks exactly the same, but the games are vastly different. Checkers, all the pieces look alike, move alike, and I treat them alike. I interact with them in the same way. I behave, they behave the same way. They receive you know, information the same way. I behave the same way. But chess, if I want to succeed, I have to connect with the piece at the uniqueness of its potential. I have to connect with each piece differently. I have to understand what it does and what it doesn't do, the way it moves, and only then can I get the full picture. So the same way with people, we have to understand and meet people at the uniqueness of their personality and not look at them as checkers pieces, but chess pieces. So parents, your kids, and you know this, your kids are different. They communicate different. They interact different. Employers, your employees are different. People are different. So number one, play chess, not checkers. The second mental image I want to leave you with is a velvet-covered brick. A velvet-covered brick, kind of an odd one. This is probably my favorite one to talk about. So Velvet covered brick, this juxtaposition of two odd things. So velvet, the outside, it's soft, it's approachable. It, you know, it's easy to, to come up to. It's, it's, it's simple, it's responsive, right? And, but then a brick on the inside, it's, there's solid boundaries, right? So as a, as a parent, we need to understand it's kind of this combination of tough and tender, res, uh, responsive, responsive but demanding, right? I believe in you, I have your back, I've got you. We, you know, we got everything we need, but here's the standard we're meeting, Here's what I expect. Here's what I think you can do, and I'm not changing it. Understanding that as parents, we need to be velvet-covered bricks. We need to understand, and maybe some of us are more velvet than brick. Maybe some are more brick than velvet. And understanding your personality kind of shows you how you need to compensate for that. Maybe if you're either more brick or more velvet, know which is which and compensate. So a velvet-covered brick. And the last one, the third one, may seem preposterous, but is surgeons and vampires. Surgeons and vampires. Now, I know that vampires are fictitious, but we're going to use it for the example of this. It's uh, maybe humorous, but I think it's a good reality to think about in our own communication. So, surgeons and vampires have a lot in common. They have a lot in common. They both draw blood, both painful, but they lead to vastly different results, right? And our society is obsessed with vampire stories, so even if you're not uh, if you feel like that's a topic we shouldn't talk about, you at least know what I'm talking about and understand the, the concept. But vampires, right? They, they work in the dark. They sneak up. 
You don't know what's happening. They attack you, right? Metaphorically here we're speaking. They bite you and you never recover. Sometimes that's the way our communication is. People don't understand. They're ambushed. After that, we leave them. They're only hurt. They're not helped. Surgeons, though, it's much different. Surgeons spend a lot of time preparing for the procedure. Everyone knows what's about to happen. Surgeons are precise. Surgeons only work on a specific area, and they leave you better for it. So in our communication, I think it's really important to think about that. Are we surgeons? Do we only talk about the things that are pertinent? Or when we get in a difficult conversation, everything goes. We begin to just attack things that have nothing to do with it. Right, we begin to hurt, and then we leave people worse off than we left them. Or, you know, are we vampires in that regard? We take everything and leave them with nothing, leave them feeling empty. As, as students and parents, you know, it's really interesting. Kaylee was reading about this, that students, the way their brains are formed and before they're uh, adults, they're less resilient to criticism. So we can hear something and it rolls off our back, but students are less resilient to criticism. They have a harder time bouncing back from that. So parents... Are we more like vampires or are we more like surgeons, specifically talking about things we need to do? As leaders, again, take this out of a parental relationship, in the workplace, being an example for Jesus Christ, are we, are we, are we more surgical and precise in our communication when we do have to have tough conversations, we're very careful, we're spirit-led, or are we like vampires, attacking and leaving people with, with less than they had? And so, uh, these things, you know, this may seem like a different, uh, you know, a different vein tonight. Why are we doing this? But here's the reality. If we get everything right in this room and get everything wrong in the living room, what are we doing? It's the, it's the reality that we face. And as a student pastor, I want to employ you par- implore you parents that the time that I have with your students is absolutely minuscule in comparison to the time that you have. At the very best, I'm only a very small complement to whatever you're doing at home whatever principles, and I'm giving it all I've got, but I've only got your students for an hour, maybe two hours a week. So what I am is just is so small in comparison to what you can be and the influence that you are as a parent in the life of your student. And so, and, and lastly, I wanna leave you with just, just simple, simple truth. I wanna, I wanna tell you, because maybe as a parent, you may feel overwhelmed. I don't know, I don't have a teenager. You may feel overwhelmed. You may feel like you're in over your head. I wanna tell somebody, don't make being perfect the priority make being present the priority. It's not about being perfect, it's about being present. We look at the Bible, we look at all of the, the people in scripture that we see are amazing and you know, did incredible things for God. Rarely will you find superhuman abilities. Rarely will you find someone of just absolute you know, character above reproach and you know, never did anything wrong, but what you will find are people that were simply faithful. They just committed to being faithful through their faults, through their failures, through their stumbling, they simply got back up and kept at it. They were faithful. So parents, students, Royalwood members, I'm calling on you tonight. It's not about being perfect. It's about being present. Faithfulness is what God prizes above everything else. And if you have faithfulness, then you can weather the storms. You can handle the mistakes because your students know that you're going to get back up and continue as a family to move forward together and do what Christ has called you to do. Amen. Why don't we stand together? Again, I know the, the, the tone and the tempo and the pace of, of tonight has been different, but I feel so burdened in my heart to just reiterate to parents, to students, that your life outside of church is so, so important. What you do at home is so, so important. The last thing uh, that I want to say as we close is, uh, is with things that you value, you need to schedule schedule your values. Let me ask you this. How many of you feel like you have just so much free time to spend with your kids, you're just overflowing with free time? Nobody. Absolutely nobody. Our lives are packed to the brim. So you know what that means? If you want time with your family, you got to make it. Can't find it. You won't find it. You got to make it. Schedule your values, parents. You value things, schedule it. Guess what? Growing up at my home, Monday night, family night, period. Family dinner, family devotion. Right now, you drive to Austin, Texas on a Monday night, you're going to find my parents and my siblings that live in Austin, you're going to find them at the house. They're, they're grown, they're out of the house, but my brother and his kids are at my parents Monday night. Why? Because they said, this is what we value, so this is what we schedule. Every, nothing, nothing comes between us and family. And it's, you know, it's not a discipline, it's beyond a discipline. It's got to be a non-negotiable. Disciplines are things that if you miss it a day or two, you can pick back up because you're disciplined. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be non-negotiable that no matter what, this comes first. 
So I wanna just encourage you, because it's tough, I understand it's tough. It's tough because you'll never find time. You've gotta make time. You've gotta schedule that time. And so parents, I hope, I hope something we've said tonight has encouraged you, maybe given you something to go on. If you're not a parent or a student here tonight, I still hope that some of the things about communication and the godly principles you can take into the workplace and use them to, be, to benefit the people around you. But uh, what I wanna do tonight is I want us to pray over our families. And maybe if you're with your family or somebody, I want you to put your arm around somebody or even maybe pray for the family, the person next to you. But the reality is this, we are facing an onslaught of the family dynamic in our culture like never before. Families are being ripped apart at the seams. And we need God. We need the intervention of the Holy Spirit to help us be successful. If I'm being honest, thinking about the world that my daughter, who's one and a half, is going is to grow up in, scares me. In the sense that, God, am I going to be ready to parent her through what's coming? Am I going to be equipped? But at the same time, I'm confident because I say, God, it's in your hands, and I'm committed to it. I'm committed to doing life with this community right here, with this body of Christ right here. So I want us to pray over our families tonight before we leave, and I, I believe that God will instill within you a holy confidence to be a confident parent, to empower you to open lines of communication with your students, to break down some of those barriers and some of those walls that may exist right now because God wants to restore your family. God wants to breathe new life into your family. God wants to do something amazing in your family. Why don't we pray together right now? Lord. I pray tonight, God, that you would help us, God. I pray for every parent in the room tonight, Lord, that you would lead us, that you would guide us, God. Give them wisdom. God, you see the moments where they feel like they don't have the right answers. God, where they feel like things are out of their control. They're not sure what to do or what to say. God, I pray that you would... Thanks for watching this video. If it has blessed you in any way, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel by clicking the button to your right. Also, if you'd like to partner with Royalwood Church to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, click the Give Now button to your right as well. Thank you so much for watching and God bless.